Well, what's up, Porch? How we doing tonight? Hey, it's uh, good to see you. Glad you're here. I hope that all is well. If this is your first time with us, uh, my name is Timothy Atik. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Watermark on Sundays as well as here at the Porch. Uh, just shout out to everyone here in the room in Dallas, but I know that there are people all over the nation that are watching right now. So I want to say hello to Porch Live Tulsa, Porch Live Scottsdale, Porch Live Boise. So glad that you guys are tuning in tonight. And if you're just by yourself watching online, welcome. I'm glad that you are with us. We are in part two of a series that we are calling, I mean, just wait for it. The title is amazing. We are calling it prayer. Yeah. Yeah, you should have seen the creative meetings that went into coming up with that. But the title of the series is Prayer, How to Talk to and Hear from God. And the goal of it is that we want every person in this room to take a step in their relationship with God in regard to prayer. Some people here love to pray. Others of peop other people uh, rarely ever pray. Wherever you're at, if you have if you never really pray, our goal is that you would start praying. If you pray occasionally, our hope is that you'd begin praying regularly. If you pray regularly, our hope is that you would pray constantly. And I would just say that prayer is something that I've been growing in over my life. And for the majority of my life, it has been something that I've really struggled with. I remember when I was a freshman at Texas A&M University, I, uh, I showed up on campus and I moved into the dorm with my best friend. And before classes had even started, I had never even been to a class at a and And uh, I remember being in my dorm room and uh, this guy knocked on our door and he said, hey, there's a group of us that are gonna go have a prayer gathering on the front lawn of the university. And my roommate and I, we were Christians. We were like, well, I guess that's what we're supposed to do in college. Like if we're Christians in college and people are praying, we should probably go and do that. But I still didn't have much experience with prayer at that point. And so we sat down on the front lawn of the university at night and we began to pray and we prayed for 10 minutes. 10 minutes turned into 20 minutes. 20 minutes turned into 30 minutes. And by that point, I'm like, guys, I, I think we've done it. Like we've, we've had the prayer gathering. Like we have gathered. It's time, you know, you reach that point where it's like, all right, Who's going to wrap this thing up and say amen? It's been a good go. 30 minutes turned into 50 minutes, which turned into to an hour. And finally, like the leader began to pray. And if you've ever been in that moment and the leader starts praying, it's just like, finally. Like you just kind of breathe that relief. And the leader said amen. And I was like, that was a great meeting. And then this girl in the group of 15 to 20 people gathering, she said, I don't think we're done. And I was like, no, we're done. Like I, <laughs> he said, amen. Like that is the, that's the ending word. You can't reopen it when you've said amen. She was like, I don't think we're done. And so we went back into it for another hour. And by the end, I was like, I'm not sure I want to do that again. And I think about that, and I think about this room, and here's the reality. There are, there are people in this room who are the I don't think we're done yet type of people. Like you love praying. You gear up for it. You're the person knocking on the door saying, hey, we've got a prayer gathering on the front lawn. Like, let's do it. And then there's other people in this room who are the, I think we were done about an hour and 30 minutes earlier type of people. And that's okay too. Like we're all in different places. But the goal is that we would all take a step. As I've thought about my own journey with prayer, I, I think I've narrowed it down to two reasons why I've struggled with prayer for a good portion of my life. It's really two reasons. The first is that I've just bought into the thought that God's going to do what he's going to do. Like God is sovereign over all things. He's going to accomplish his purposes. So whether I pray or not, the reality is that God is in charge. God is moving. God's going to do what he's going to do. So I can pray. But regardless of whether I pray, God is going to, he's, he's just going to do what he's going to do. The second reason I've struggled with prayer is that there have been times in the past where I've prayed 
and God hasn't seemed to answer my prayers. And I don't know if you've experienced that. I would imagine that's true for everyone in this room. Like there's, there is times where I've begged God to heal someone who is dealing with some type of uh, illness, sickness, and God hasn't seemed to respond. Even more recently, there, there, have, been, there have been prayers that I've prayed that it, it would just seem so easy for God to say the word and it would happen. And it would bring flourishing in people's lives. It, it, I look and I just say, God, you have all the power in the world. It would be so easy for you to do this one small thing. And then the opposite happens. And when that has happened, it's just caused me to wonder, what's, what's the point anyway? And so I just wonder if anyone in the room can, can identify with that. You know, over the last couple of years, God has done a significant work in my life in regard to prayer. And I, I, I'm embarrassed to admit that it took a better part of 40 years to really tap into the joy that you can experience through, through prayer. And I think where I've finally begun to land on those two things that were holding me back from praying is this. In regard to the thought that God's going to do what he's going to do, here's what I've figured out, is that God is going to do what he's going to do, but part of God's sovereign plans is his people praying. And so there are times where God won't do things because his people haven't prayed yet. And so God in his sovereignty will get the most glory when his people pray and he responds and they celebrate that he has worked. And so part of God's sovereignty, he is able to work it out that he will, he will work in a way that involves his people praying and him accomplishing his purposes. And so over the last couple of years, I've just sensed God inviting me into his sovereign plans. And my role to play is praying. And then in regard to praying and God not answering some of my prayers, and that has been a very real thing for me. It's been a very personal thing for me. And I think what I've, what, where the Lord has been just stretching my faith in some of the hardest moments of life, where I've really felt like God is stretching me, is I have to make a choice if I believe that the word of God is true, and if the God of this Bible is the God that I believe in, and if I truly believe that the God that I pray to is the God of this scripture, then where my faith has been stretched is to believe that even in the midst of the hurt and the heartache of life, that if I got to see what God sees, I wouldn't change a thing. And that is an aspect of faith where the Lord is just sinking my roots deeper to believe that from my limited perspective, all I can see is the moment I am in right now. And if I was in control, I would change this moment. But if I could see what God sees, he sees the beginning from the end, I wouldn't change a thing. And I wouldn't argue with any of it. And so God, over the last couple of years, has just been inviting me into deeper places of joy in regard to prayer. And I want it for you as well. And so what tonight and next week should feel like is in some ways a marriage counselor's office. And you're like, dude, wrong crowd. Like none of us are married. You can counsel us on how to get married and find someone to marry. But uh, in regard to saving a marriage, like not there. But here's the reality. Anyone who, any couple that finds themselves in a marriage counselor's office, the reason they're there is because of communication issues. There's been a breakdown in communication. There's a lack of intimacy because there's a lack of communication. The same is true in your relationship with God. If you sense a lack of intimacy, I promise you it's because there's a lack of communication. And so this week and next week is just all about how to talk to God and how to hear from God. Here is the great news. The great news is that a good amount of people in this room already have memorized the key to greater intimacy with God through prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer. 
It's the most famous teaching in the Bible on prayer. It is Jesus' greatest message to us on prayer. So let's just say it together if you know it. Jesus says to pray in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Whether you realize it or not, Jesus has given us that Lord's Prayer as the model for how to pray. Some of you are like, you said debts, I say trans trespasses. What's up with that? <laughs> right? You're like, you said thy. He said it differently. Did I memorize it wrong? You're good. There's different versions. We're all okay. But it holds the keys, and I want to look at it tonight, line by line. So if you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me to the Lord's Prayer, which is found in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 falls in the longest sermon that Jesus ever gave. It's the greatest sermon that has ever been given. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. It spans three chapters in the Bible, Matthew 5 through 7. I would encourage you to read it sometime. It is, it is an amazing sermon. And in this sermon, the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, Jesus devotes a portion of it to the topic of prayer because he wants his people to know how to connect with God and experience intimacy through prayer. Now, here's what I want you to see. Look at how verse 9 starts. This is right before Jesus goes into the Lord's Prayer. Look at how he starts verse 9. He says, pray then like this. What Jesus doesn't say is pray this. He says pray like this. So Jesus didn't give us the Lord's Prayer just for us to put it on repeat and to mindlessly recite it like there is some value to us waking up in the morning and mindlessly going through our Father who art in heaven. No, he gave us the Lord's Prayer as a framework. He says, pray then like this. So what the Lord's Prayer is, it's a template that shows us how to pray, not as much what to pray, but how to pray. And as we look at the Lord's Prayer, it, it shows us that, that there are four key ways to pray. And here they are. You want to pray with clarity. You want to pray expectantly. You want to pray with humility. And you want to pray dependently. I promise you. If you want your prayer life to go from zero to 60, if you want to take a step to greater intimacy with Jesus, then begin to pray in these four ways. And we're going to see those fleshed out in the Lord's Prayer. So let's just begin to walk through it. First, if you want to take a step in your prayer life, I want to encourage you to pray with clarity. Look at how Jesus teaches us to pray. He says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is really interesting because Jesus encourages us to address God as Father. So when I talk about praying with clarity, what I'm really talking about is praying with a clarity regarding who God is. That when you close your eyes and you begin to talk, you want to make sure that you know exactly who you're talking to. A lot of times when we go to pray, we just begin to pray about what we need but where Jesus starts is praying in regard to the who, not what, but who. You want to be clear on who you're talking to before you begin to clarify what you need from that person. And he wants us to realize that we are praying to our Father in heaven. See, this is the beauty of the gospel and, and if you're new to Christianity, if you're just checking out the porch, if you got tricked into being here, your friend was like, let's go to happy hour. And they brought you here and they were like, it's going to be a happy hour here at the porch. I'm so glad you made it. Like, you just need to know the good news that we rally around here is that we were enemies of God and we have become children of God because of the grace of God. 
That, that is the message of Christianity, that Jesus Christ has come, God in the flesh. He has died for all of our sins. He has risen from the dead, conquering all of our sins. And through faith, we can be made right with a perfect God. But without knowing, without a relationship with Jesus, the Bible would say that we are enemies of God. We're not in neutral standing with God. We are enemies of God. But when we put our faith in Jesus, we who are enemies, we become children so that we can go to God in prayer and address him as father. So we want to pray with clarity about who God is. It's interesting that that God is not referred to as a father of an individual anywhere in the Old Testament, which is the first two-thirds of your Bible. But then Jesus shows up and he refers to God as father 195 different times and he invites us to do the same because Jesus is trying to clarify for us, God is a personal God. God doesn't want you to just know him as the creator of the universe. He doesn't want to just be known as a higher power. He wants you to know him as father. And I would just say that has become so meaningful to me as I've become a father of three crazy boys. I've got Noah who's 13, Andrew who is 11, and Jake who is five. And being a dad has shined so much light on, on who God is. Like I think about the fact, and I shared it a couple weeks ago, but I delight in my three boys. So my five-year-old Jake, he just graduated from preschool yesterday. Like when I say he graduated, I mean like there was, thank you. I'll, I'll tell him that 2,000 people applauded for him. He won't know what to do with it. But when I say he graduated, I'm literally saying he wore a cap in a gown and he walked down an aisle and he walked across the stage. His name was called. And when I showed up to that graduation ceremony of like 10 kids and 30 parents, and they push play on a slideshow, I'm like getting choked up. Because I'm like, that's, that's my kid. It's my kid graduating. And I was thinking about Jake, my five-year-old, like when he was two, I will never forget, I was preparing a message talking about God as father. And as I'm preparing it, I hear the doorknob of my home office rattling. Jake's two years old. He rattles it and just bursts in while I'm prepping. And he has a french fry in his hand. And he just came in to show me his french fry. And then he walked out and he closed the door. I'm like, dude, I just want to get this straight. You were eating your nuggets and fries. You got up, you're like, you know who needs to see this french fry? You walked down the hall. You as a two-year-old figured out how to open the doorknob to show me that fry. And when he left, like I started getting choked up. I'm like, I just delighted my kid. You know, I think about my, um, my, one of my boys who has just navigated different challenges. And there have been moments where I've just thought, I will do anything. I will leverage any influence I have to do whatever I can to help him flourish. Like there's this like zeal in me for his well-being. Or I remember when my oldest kid was in kindergarten, he was getting bullied by this kid. Like, I went to the lunchroom. I sat down at the table across from that six-year-old who was bullying my kid. And I was like, I'm the captain now. Like, look right at me. <laughs> and I was like, we're not going to do that anymore, right? And my wife was like, you probably shouldn't do that. And I was like, well, it's just this like protective nature. And I think I am such a sinful, imperfect human being. Like if you were to ask my wife and kids, they'd be like, yes, he has his good moments and he definitely has his bad moments. Like he is far from perfect. He's a sinful human being. And yet I look at what Matthew chapter 7, verse 11 says about God. It says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Do you know what that's saying? It's saying, look, you look at earthly fathers, you, Timothy Atik, you 
experience delight in your kids and this protectiveness and this desire for them to flourish in your very imperfect. But Jesus says when we address our Father, we are addressing our Father in heaven. Do you know what that means? It means that our heavenly Father is a perfect Father. And some of y'all desperately need to hear that because when you hear me talking about being a dad, you're like, none of this connects for me. Here's the reality. We often project our experiences with our earthly fathers under our experience with our heavenly father. And some of you guys had miserable experiences with your earthly father. And so the idea of God being father is the one that is an idea that will feel very distant from you. And I just want to invite you in to see God in a new and redeeming way tonight. What I want you to know is that if you're here and you had a great earthly dad, all of the, all of the good that your earthly father has been, God is infinitely more. That's my story. I have a great dad. I have a great mom and dad. My mom and dad have shown me unconditional love and generosity and support for 42 years of life. And yet you might hear that and be like, not my dad. My dad was absent. My dad was abusive. I was never enough for my dad. My dad was controlling. My dad made relentless comments to me about my looks and my weight. My dad insisted on everything being perfect in my life. And so what I want you to hear me say is all of the bad that your, in, your earthly dad was, God is infinitely not. And your story doesn't have to be, I didn't have an earthly father. Your story should be, I have a perfect heavenly father. God wants to be the father that you never had. He wants to be the father that you never had. And so my encouragement to you is to begin to pray with clarity. God is your perfect father. You are his child. He loves you. He delights in you. The beauty, if you know Jesus, the scripture uses this phrase over and over that we are in Christ. We are hidden in Christ. Here's what that means. All of the love that God the Father has for his son Jesus, he now has for you because you're in Christ. All the delight God the Father has for Jesus, he has for you. All the acceptance and approval, it is for you. Imagine how different life would be if you woke up tomorrow morning believing that you have a perfect heavenly Father who delights in you. It's amazing. It's, it's crazy because I have such an amazing earthly dad. And yet when it comes to my heavenly father, I can still lean towards performance. So if I'm having great quiet times, I feel great. If my quiet times aren't so great. I feel like a failure. And I just wonder if my perfect heavenly father is like, don't, don't, don't put that on me. No, I delight in you. I sent my son to redeem you to make you right in my eyes so that I could pour out my love and acceptance upon you. And so Jesus says, pray with clarity. But he doesn't stop with just God being a perfect father. He says, our father in heaven. And what does he go on to say? He says, hallowed be your name. That word hallowed in the Greek, it means to be set apart or made holy. So Jesus is saying that when you pray to God, you want to pray to the God who is set apart. God doesn't need to be set apart. He already is set apart. He doesn't need to be made holy. He is already holy, holy, holy. And so what Jesus does here, and I need you to see this, is because he is navigating this tension between familiarity and supremacy, that God wants you to feel that he is very familiar as a follower, as a father, and yet he is supreme, and there's no one like him. God is so other than anything we could ever imagine. Like, we have to hold in tension the fact that the Bible refers to God as a God who dwells in 
unapproachable light. Like he is so holy that we couldn't even approach him if we wanted to. And at the same time, the Bible says that we should boldly approach the throne of grace. So we hold in tension that God is unapproachable, yet completely approachable. That if you read the Old Testament, if people saw God, they just collapsed on the ground. If God spoke audibly, people felt like they were having a near-death experience. And yet God wants us to see him and hear from him every single day. And so what Jesus is saying is that we hold this tension, this familiarity. He's a perfect father. And yet we hold in the other hand his supremacy, that there's no one like him. So we come to him with a reverence because he is holy, holy, holy. So Jesus' first encouragement is to pray Pray with clarity. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Number two, we want to pray expectantly. We want to pray expectantly. That's why Jesus encourages us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is the realm where where Christ rules and reigns. See, here's the reality. When you begin to pray with clarity, when you realize that God is a perfect heavenly father, when you begin to see God as holy, 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 that there is no one like him, you know what you end up doing? You begin to pray expectantly like you want Christ's rule and reign in your life. Why? Because you're convinced that he's a good king. So when I begin to pray in my own life, when I start by reminding myself of who God is, because one of the things that you have to remember when you pray is your view of God will determine your response to God. If you start praying with a small view of God, you're going to have a very small response to God. But when you go into prayer and you begin to remind yourself of who God is, it expands your view of him. So you're going to have an expanded response to him. So when you begin to see God clearly as a good and perfect father and king, you know what you do is you begin to invite his rule and reign into your life. You want Jesus Christ to rule. You pray expectantly like, Jesus Christ, you're a good king. Come rule and reign in my life. A while back, I decided to get into collecting sports cards. And some of you are like, nerd alert. No, here's the deal. Like, I don't know if you know this, but over COVID, like the the sport card industry hit a boom. That's why a Mickey Mantle card sold for over $11 million. Like, there's been something crazy that has happened. So all of these middle-aged men started collecting cards, including this guy. But anyway, um, for my son, my oldest son's birthday, I bought him a few... Uh, boxes of football cards, and I handed them to him. I bought them for him because I wanted them. But anyway, uh, I'm watching him begin to open them, and as he's opening them, I'm like, here, dude, I'll do it. And I take all the packs from him, and I begin to open them myself. So now my son, who the cards belong to, is watching his middle-aged dad Open these packs. Why? Because I didn't trust him with them. Which is interesting because they belong to him. But you know what my fear was? My fear was that he wouldn't value them like I would value them. And I wonder if we do the same thing in our relationships with Jesus. Like, we belong to Jesus. Psalm 24 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, including you. You belong to God. You are His. And yet, we try and grab our lives back from Him. Like, you know what? I don't, I don't know that I trust you to handle my life like I can handle it. Because I don't know that you're going to value different things like I would value them. Like, I don't know that you're going to value. My, my romantic life, my relationship, like I would value it. So I need to cling to this relationship that is honestly toxic, but I don't want to let go of it because I don't know that I trust you with my relationship status. 
And I think God's like, really? You would value it more? I invented romantic love. I'm the one who thought it up. You're welcome, by the way. Or we're like, you know what? I'm going to cling to the money that I do have because I don't, I don't know that you value money like I value money. And God's like, I own a cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is mine and everything in it. I, I think I value money more than you value it because all the money in the universe belongs to me anyway. Or sometimes we're like, don't touch my sex life because that, that's kind of my thing. And, and God, I know you're against it and the world is for it. And I'm kind of with the world on this one. It's, it's good and I'm for it. And I think God's like, you're for it. I invented it. Like I'm the one who thought it up. And so when we begin to see God clearly for who he is, we begin to realize, no, he's a good king. He can rule and reign in my life. And we begin to pray expectantly, like, God, have your way. Do what you want to do in me. But we don't just want it in our individual lives. We want it throughout the world. We want it in the lives of our friends and family who don't know the Lord. So we begin to pray. You need to know I have prayed for you tonight that Jesus Christ would rule and reign in your life hearts. Some of you tonight need to say yes to Jesus for the first time ever. But others of us, we see the brokenness in the world. We we see the natural disasters and the mass shootings that are happening on a weekly basis. And we, there's rape and sexual abuse and, and cancer and all sorts of disorders. And we begin to pray expectantly when we are clear on who God is, because what we want is we want the rule and reign of Christ to permeate the earth. And a day is coming according to the end of the Bible, Revelation 21, will there be no more death, no more tears, no no more pain, because Jesus Christ is going to make all things new. And so when we pray, we pray expectantly that his kingdom would come and his will would be done. Third, we pray with humility. We pray with humility. So Jesus goes on and says, and give us this day our daily bread. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But I want you to see, he goes on and says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So Jesus encourages us, hey, if you want to heat your prayer life up, then bring forgiveness into your prayer life. And what he means is, Like, make it a regular rhythm to ask God's forgiveness. Let me explain it this way. What you need to understand is when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus didn't just die to save you from hell, even though he did die to save you from hell. But he died and rose from the dead to save you into a spiritual family. The reason I say that if you know Jesus Christ, you belong to a spiritual family is because you now have a heavenly father, but you also now have spiritual brothers and sisters. Every Christian on the earth is now your brother or sister in Christ, which means you have brothers and sisters from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, which is amazing. But... If, if you want your prayer life to really take off, then what Jesus is encouraging is, hey, you, prayer is a key to maintaining health within the spiritual family. And there's a vertical component and there's a horizontal component to this. So prayer is one of the ways that you maintain intimacy with God when you sin. It's kind of like this. Okay, I've told you, I've now talked about my boys a lot in this message, primarily because we're talking about God being father. But if one of my kids does something that I ask them not to do, like if they break the rules that I've put into place, I don't look at them and say, well, fine, if you're going to break my rules, you are no longer in a teak. So you can't use my last name because You are no longer a part of this family. You are now just Noah or just Andrew, kind of like Pink or Usher. Like you are now just Jake because you're no longer in a teak. No, that's not how it works. They will always be in a teak. But when when they sin against me, it disrupts our intimacy. 
it is good and right for them to come and to ask my forgiveness. That's what we've taught our kids to do, and we try and model that for them. And when they ask forgiveness, you know what it does? It allows me to, to embrace them and extend forgiveness, and it draws us back to one another. Same, same thing with God. If, if God is our heavenly Father, when we sin against God, you know what prayer is? It is a vehicle to, to bring us back into intimacy with God. When we sin, God doesn't give up on us and say, well, fine, you're no longer my kid. But sin will absolutely disrupt intimacy with God. And so confession should be a normal, a daily routine for us where we are coming to God and we are asking forgiveness for the ways that we have lived contrary to his ways and it pulls us in close to God. But there's also a horizontal component to things. That's why Jesus says for us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That there is a horizontal component to maintaining the health of the spiritual family. Because we as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are going to hurt each other. We are going to wrong one another. And that will impact our intimacy with God as well. It's kind of like this. If, If my son Noah gets mad at Andrew and he refuses to sit at the dinner table because Andrew is at the dinner table, that impacts his relationship with me. Because by being unwilling to sit at the table with Andrew, he is also unwilling to sit at the table with me. And I'm not going to act like everything is okay. And so one of the ways that we maintain health in the family is through is through prayer, is by extending forgiveness to one another. And one of the ways that we do that is by asking God for strength through prayer to forgive those who have wronged us and to ask for forgiveness from those we we have wronged. It's hard to hate someone that you're praying for. The reality is that sometimes we don't want to forgive those who have hurt us, and yet God has forgiven us. When we refuse to forgive It's like we're saying, God, I deserved for you to forgive me, but this person doesn't deserve for me to forgive them. What I did against you was forgivable. What this person has done against me is unforgivable, and it just shows a misunderstanding of the gravity of your sin. Prayer is one of the things that keeps health in the family. So we want to pray with humility where we just say, God, you are God and I'm not. Would you forgive me for the ways that I've sinned against you? Would you give me the strength to forgive those who have wronged me? I will not walk in pride saying, no, it'll be my way, and my way is unforgiveness. No, we're going to say, it's your way. You have called me to forgive. Give me the strength I need to take a step. And then finally, we want to pray dependently. We want to pray dependently. We're going to circle back now to verse 11 where Jesus encourages us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Bread symbolizes the most basic of necessities. In the first century, workers would get paid by the day. So just imagine if one one of them got sick for a few days, it could be tragic for them and their family. And so the picture here is of this daily reliance upon the Lord to supply what is needed. And so what this is, is this is an invitation to complete dependence. My friend John Elmore, he says, there's a reason that Jesus d- encourages us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. He doesn't say our monthly bread or our yearly bread because what God wants most for us, he knows that the greatest joy is in dependence upon him. So he invites us into a dependent lifestyle where we are dependent upon him for our greatest needs every moment of the day. And we express that dependence through prayer. So I just want you to think, what is making you anxious right now? What is it? Like what causes that low leveling of anxiety in you? God wants to know about it. Yesterday, my five-year-old, he was so anxious about graduation, almost to the point of tears. Like when he walked down the aisle, Kat and I were like, Jake, and he, like, he, he was like five feet away and he wouldn't turn because he was just 
robotic because he was just so anxious. He was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. And me as his dad, Kat as his mom, we can see the anxiety that he was carrying. Why? Due to a lack of perspective. He couldn't see what we see. He didn't know what we knew. That he had everything he needed to make it. And he had people who cared about his well-being, who could lead him through. And the same is true with God. From our limited perspective, we think that we need to have everything in control. God will intentionally lead you into places that you cannot control. Why? So that you would begin to understand Colossians 1.17, which says that Jesus Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Not in your understanding, but in Jesus' understanding of all things. So we pray dependently, not just for our daily needs, but also for the sake of victory. Jesus ends the prayer by saying, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's interesting in the Greek, the word that's been translated temptation, it can also be translated testing. So it always depends on the context whether the implication is testing or temptation. God never tempts us, but God will lead us into tough situations where our faith will be tested. And in those moments of trial when our faith is being tested, our enemy, the devil, will use it as an opportunity to tempt us. Sometimes the the greatest moments of trial are also the greatest moments of temptation. And so what Jesus is encouraging us to pray when he says, lead us not into temptation, he's encouraging us to pray, don't lead us into a season of testing. Like God, please don't lead me into difficult circumstances. But then he says to pray, but deliver us from evil. So here's the thought, God, please don't lead me into a tough season. But if you do, if you do, deliver me from the evil one who will seek to tempt me and discourage me while you testing me are trying to strengthen my faith, the devil will seek to shatter my faith. So in those moments, guard me, protect me from the evil one. And I would just say, over the last year I've shared, the last year of my life has been the hardest year ever. And my faith has been tested, and I'm a stronger Christian today than I was a year ago. Why? Because a season of testing has strengthened my faith. But all along the way, the devil has sought to tempt me. Why? To shatter my faith. He has tempted me to believe that God is not good, and he's not worthy of my life. And he will do the same with you. And so Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer. That's a, it's a great place to start. Look, here's the reality. I want to be one of the I don't think we are done yet people when it comes to prayer. I don't want to be one of the I think we were done 30 minutes ago. Why? Because I don't see the value in prayer. Like that's where I want to be. And over the last couple of years, I've begun to see that the joy is in prayer. That prayer isn't about getting something from God. It is about getting more of God. And that's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. And a great place to start is with the Lord's Prayer. And so I hope and pray that this week you would use it as a framework. But I'll close by saying this. Some of you are here tonight and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's interesting that in the first century, unbelievers were prohibited from praying the Lord's Prayer. Why? Because it didn't make sense for someone to pray to God as Father when they were not yet his child. And maybe you're here tonight and you're able to say that God is a father, but you're not able to say God is my father, my heavenly father. That only comes through faith in Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you want to be able to know God as your heavenly father, if you want to know his love and delight in you, it starts with you saying yes to Jesus Christ. Yes to his death, yes to his burial, yes to his resurrection, that he went to the cross to save you from your sins. You can know him tonight. Let's pray together.
Lord, I thank you that you're a perfect father. I thank you that you love us deeply. Hallowed be your name. God, if you were to walk into the room, we would all fall on our faces. If you were to speak audibly, we would feel like we just nearly escaped death. And yet, you call us close to you to be your children. I praise you for that, Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives. Would you rule and reign in our hearts, Lord? God, you know what we need. God, I pray that you would supply us with what we need today, knowing that tomorrow will take care of itself, Lord. God, wherever there is unforgiveness in our hearts, would you empower us to forgive? Wherever we've sinned against you, would you reveal it that we might seek your forgiveness? And Lord, in the tough seasons of life, God, would you strengthen our faith? Would you protect us from the devil who would seek to discourage us? We need you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.